We are very proud today, Michael and I, to be here to talk about what Avitru and Sustainable Minds are doing right now and what we have planned for this year and going forward as we both share this vision of bringing higher performing, greener and healthier products beyond the knowledge of those people who care today out to the broader marketplace so that they simply become mainstream. That's why this is part of our webinar series, Transparency is the New Green, with the special topic in product selection and specification. And it is our intent together to make it easier for architects, engineers, and contractors to find, understand, select, and specify products to construct higher performing, greener, healthier buildings and be able to do that in, in one place. So I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Michael Heinsdorf from Avitru. Hi, Michael. Hello, Terry, thanks for the introduction. Um, many of you probably have known us as ARCOM in the past, that was short for Architectural Computer Services. We have been the uh, exclusive producer and distributor of master spec, uh, the AIA specification system for almost the past 30 years, I wanna say. Um, we did recently rebrand as a Vitru. Um, we'll, I'll get into that in a little bit later as to exactly why we did that. But the, the big reason is we're gonna do, we're looking at forward with doing a lot more with specifications, uh, sustainable minds, and the work that we're doing with them is just one piece of it. Um, and we're very excited to uh, be here and, and discuss a little more about uh, sustainable products and how to bring transparency into specifications. So um, most of you who are on this webinar uh, know Avitru slash Arcom slash MesterSpec. Many of you know Sustainable Minds, but many of you don't. And so this webinar is really going to be uh, doing a deep dive on, on Sustainable Minds, who we are, what we do, and it will come together. You'll see why it makes a lot of sense for these two organizations to be working together, and we'll cover that in the company introductions. But then after that, um, we'll look at um, how we believe, uh, looking at the data, how product transparency, having been introduced as a concept in 2012, has emerged from early adoption and is now in early mainstream. We're going to look at the challenges that that represents both for AECs and manufacturers. We're going to look at data that Sustainable Minds has aggregated through uh, the creation and curation of the transparency catalog and kind of put a finer point on it, why transparency is a key driver uh, to creating a higher performing uh, built environment. And, you know, the, the the hint is that high performance uh, is a term now used to go beyond energy efficiency or just energy. Uh, it really refers to all of the inputs into the building across its life cycle, including energy consumption and efficiency. So product transparency was really that new piece that was introduced with LEED version four and other green building rating systems have adopted it as well as the clear extension to what high performing uh, originally meant when the term was introduced. Michael will then spend some time going through uh, a tour of product master spec, master spec and product master spec. And then I'll talk about the transparency catalog and how it was conceived, why it's designed the way it's designed, who it's for, and uh, We'll look at some of the uh, features and functionality. We'll do a demo. And then we'll wrap it up looking at the solutions that we're working on together. It is our intent to really have a tremendous impact on how decisions about building products will get made going forward. Keeping in mind, we've just gotten started, so we have a, a lot of uh, ambitious goals. So Michael, tell us about Avitru, now, now known as Avitru. Well, like I said, it was uh, formerly known as Arcom. We've been around for quite a while. It's still the same company, um, most of the same content specialists, management, et cetera. Um, as I mentioned, we are the exclusive publisher of MasterSpec, which is the AIA's specification system. Um, 
at this point in time, we've got about uh, 60 content specialists along with, uh, well, and when I, I'm sorry, it's not 60 content specialists, but we've got 60 employees um, divided among content specialists, which are architects and engineers. Then we have uh, an IT component, software and support um, professionals within the company. Um, Master Spec itself is about 900 plus specification system se sections. I believe we're at about 910 as of the first quarter of uh, 2018, which is about at, uh, conservatively 6,000 plus products. Once you start putting in variations on products, that number rises pretty dramatically, but that's generally what we would call about the base number of products within it. Um, it is a point at this point in time, the most widely used guide specification system in the United States. Um, we've just got about 80% of the ENR top 100 firms using master spec. Um, and then on the architectural record list, I believe it's about 64 to 68% um, or 64 to 68 of that top 100. Um, one of the reasons we rebranded and became a Vitru is we were trying to really um, not only, you know, communicate to the world that we were doing a couple different things, um, but we also wanted to really come up with a mission, vision, and values that really reflected uh, where the company was and where we were going, and it wasn't necessarily there with the old, the old name. Um, one of the missions of the company at this point in time is that we are committed to construct a world where better building leads to better lives. Um, and part of that is, you know, through doing the content that we have with MasterSpec, with serving um, both architects and engineers, whether it's through content or the software uh, offerings that we have, such as um, the master spec toolbar or spec builder cloud application or the eSpecs for Revit application. Um, we also are making a commitment um, to sustainability. As I mentioned, the uh, partnership that we have with Sustainable Minds is really our first step in that direction. And we really look look forward to doing a lot more with both this partnership with Sustainable Minds, which will tell you, you know, where we're starting and then where we're going. Um, but then also uh, what we're what we're looking to do forward and as we move forward with master spec and evolve it to meet the requirements of a world where you know the practice of architecture and engineering is is fairly rapidly evolving as technology gets introduced more and more and that's it for me right now terry thanks michael so uh sustainable minds is a 10 year old company i i am the founder terry swack and ceo still and I'm what you call a serial entrepreneur. Um, lots of people probably don't know this, but I'll share this with you that um, by education, I'm a graphic designer. And my very first company was a graphic design firm that evolved to become an internet strategy and product development firm. We were one of the early pioneers in developing user experience and customer experience strategies and practices in designing online business systems. I sold that company uh, to a company called Razorfish, kind of at the height of the bubble, and turned my attention to applying what I knew how to do to things that mattered. And uh, I did a company uh, before Sustainable Minds uh, in the green building space, but I started Sustainable Minds in 2007, uh, really thinking about the way to make the biggest impact is going to be to deliver knowledge and tools to the people making things, whether they're making products or buildings or infrastructure. Everybody needs knowledge and tools to be able to make better decisions and be able to have data to make trade-off decisions between traditional criteria like functional performance, cost, aesthetic, safety, and now bringing environmental performance and material health uh, into that equation. We are a mission-based company. Our mission is to operationalize environmental performance into mainstream product development and manufacturing to drive revenue and growth through greener product innovation. And I say that uh, right up front uh, because, you know, quote unquote, doing the right thing isn't the way to grow a business and, and drive change. Uh, change happens through innovation uh, with the right uh, motivation to do it. And we're going to get to that a little bit later in the presentation when I talk about uh, our business model. In the company, we have 
deep expertise in product transparency, LCA expertise, material ingredient analysis expertise, as I mentioned, customer experience, information design, and deep experience in designing and delivering cloud software. Our very first product, we spent two years doing R&D to bring the first eco-design and LCA software tool delivered in the cloud for product development organizations to be able to use LCA in early stage design to evaluate the potential impacts of products and be able to make better informed decisions uh, using uh, a strategy framework that would get them to think differently and really drive innovation. Uh, Autodesk was our lead investor at the time, so we were pretty excited about that. And that software tool in 10 years has uh, been widely adopted and uh, coincidentally, very widely adopted in education, higher education, business design and engineering uh, all, all around the world. So we actually look at the whole cycle of design and now marketing that making greener product decisions is a continuous improvement loop. Manufacturers have to have knowledge to make better decisions. People who purchase their products need to have knowledge to make better decisions. And those decisions and those desires drive that continuous improvement. And the products and services from Sustainable Minds sit around that whole cycle. So Michael and I attended an event at Green Build that actually Michael helped organize with with the AIA Materials Industry Forum and brought together a a group of uh, manufacturers, uh, AECs, software folks, some of the technical folks in the industry to have this discussion about how are we going to accelerate this broader adoption of of product product transparency and what are the most urgent challenges. The list, the takeaway from that meeting was, number one, the need for product transparency education across the industry, everybody, AECs and manufacturers. The second, standardization of technical guidelines, making standards more standardized on the environmental performance side. And on the material ingredient side, we've seen for a number of years now harmonization efforts Uh, but to standardize the technical guidelines so they're not so diffuse and also standardize the delivery of their results, the presentation and the delivery of the results so they become easier to consume, interpret and consume. The third was make it easier to find products with credible transparency information. That probably doesn't need any more explanation. In fact, manufacturers uh, are really struggling with this, uh, how to make their products with transparency information easier to find. And there was the perception in the room from the AEC community that there wasn't enough products yet with transparency information. And we'll we'll see that that uh, is, is probably not the case anymore. And then finally, you know, the biggest uh, item from the manufacturing community was, hey, you know, we've invested in product transparency. We're doing it. We're responding to the market. We're learning a lot. It's expensive. It's time consuming. It's hard. It's risky. We need to be able to see an effect. We need to be able to see an improvement uh, in our business. We need to be uh, rewarded for doing this. And so if all of these four things really get addressed and turned around, we are going to be able to create uh, that vision, uh, turn it into a reality of a built environment that actually causes less stress on the built, uh, the natural environment and, and human health. So now let's look kind of historically at at product transparency, what got this going, and um, really what got it going uh, was the announcement of of LEED version 4 in in 2012. 
where the folks uh, at the USGBC felt as though uh, the single attribute certifications uh, like indoor air quality, recycled content, um, those are important, but they tell a slice of a story about a product and they don't necessarily even apply to all products. So they were looking for some way to be asking manufacturers to be more comprehensive, more technical, more scientific, and so therefore turned to the technical community and learned through the LCA community that life cycle assessment and ISO 14025 and all the technical standards that support type three environmental declarations could be a great way to move into uh, manufacturing, to use LCA, to evaluate products and environmental product declarations or type three environmental declarations to report. And then looking at cradle to cradle and some of the other early green screen and some of the other material evaluation programs, how could those get more systematized? And so the early credits, these pilot credits were created to see if, if the market could be uh, stimulated to, to respond. And thankfully, there were enough architecture firms who had enough influence uh, to be able to say, hey, this is important. Let's, let's get this off the ground. And shortly thereafter, other green building rating systems said, hey, this product transparency thing is kind of a good idea. And then over the years, there have been even more new green building rating systems that have uh, come about uh, that have also embraced product transparency. So now there are five green building rating systems that reward product transparency, which means that there are more AECs looking for products with transparency information. We put the emphasis on the word products because you're not looking for disclosures. You're looking for products that also have disclosures. And so I'm going to leave this slide with this question, how easy is it to find products? But even more importantly, what do you learn about the manufacturer as well as the products when you find those disclosures? Because remember, manufacturers really do have two key challenges that they want and they need to credibly design greener products as well as be able to market those greener products. And if they're actually designing greener products, they're going to have real stories to tell when they take those products to the marketplace. And the drivers are the same behind both of those initiatives, cost and competition for natural resources, regulation, risk management, our external drivers. The internal ones are clearly, how do we innovate, bring new products to market, get new revenue, new customers, and how do we take what we're doing to leverage those attributes into our brand. Brand building is all about creating preference. So here at Sustainable Minds, uh, we believe that product transparency does build credibly greener brands, but not by just producing disclosures. We think the value for manufacturers to provide information, environmental and material information about their products comes from demonstrating that they understand what that information means and they actually know what they're doing. So with, with that in mind, I'm gonna show you what Sustainable Minds has been working on for the past five years since product transparency was introduced as a thing because we were already in the LCA space helping manufacturers think about how to design and manufacture greener products. So when we heard yes, this is being recommended to bring out to for use in a public facing way to non-technical readers like the architecture community. We thought, wow, that, that's gonna be hard. That's gonna be hard to make that work and, and see that scale. And so uh, again, I mentioned I was a graphic designer by training. Uh, it just seemed to us that well, why wouldn't you put all this environmental information in the same place as you'd put all the other information that people use to make decisions about products? And so really what that means is integrating product transparency into product marketing. So every year we have focused on a different piece of that problem. 
year one, 2013, we said, okay, well, the most important thing to work on is to make the product transparency information understandable, and then also to make it meaningful. And those are two different things. I can explain something technical to you so you understand it from a conceptual way, uh, but I have to give you some more information to make it meaningful to you. What, what, is it, what does it mean? What does it mean to the company? What does it mean for you? When you put those things together, now you can really make uh, an informed and, and meaningful decision. So we created our, our own brand of type three environmental declaration. We call it a transparency report. We'll touch, touch on that a little bit later, but it's short, understandable, and everything somebody needs to make a decision is all in one place in the cloud. A year two in 2014, uh, we became a program operator uh, because we recognized the uh, inefficiency of the technical standards for doing product category rules and creating type three envir environmental declarations. Uh, every program operator in North America had their own technical program. So every LCA provider, every time they went to go do an LCA had to uh, read a very detailed PCR, they're all different. Every time a group of manufacturers or an industry organization went to create a product category rule, they had to reinvent and rewrite 100% of the rules every single time. So we created the first two-part PCR program for North America, building on what was already happening in Europe, but building it from the ground up for North America, where 80% of the rules of how to do the LCA are in part A. And part B contains the 20% of the rules that are specific to that product group that the PCR is being done for. So a part A and a part B equal one complete PCR, but the time to create that part B is dramatically reduced as well as is the cost. In 2015, we continued working on standardization of delivering environmental information, now turning our attention to material ingredient disclosure. So we took the format of the transparency report and created our material health overview, which presents the results of any of the material ingredient programs in a standardized way with the functional information, as well as the interpretation. What does it mean? How is that rating achieved? What does it mean that there are benchmark one ingredients? Uh, how is the manufacturer improving the material ingredients and material health of its products? And we also became uh, a founding member of the Program Operator Consortium, again, in this effort to standardize the way technical programs were being uh, delivered, uh, created and delivered. And then finally, by 2016, we turned our attention to findability, uh, this big question of how do you help manufacturers get their products found, and ultimately, uh, how do you get them rewarded for making those investments in, in product transparency? So we launched the catalog in 2016 at GreenBuild, so it was October of 2016. And this year, uh, in 2017, or last year, excuse me, uh, we now focused on making that product transparency information actionable, not just being able to find content and documents that are understandable and meaningful, but now how do you put that information to work to be able to specify products, make sure those specifications requests get into the spec and ultimately into the project and help manufacturers help you make sure that that gets done. So since October of 2016, the way that we build the catalog uh, is that because we have deep knowledge of environmental reporting and material reporting, uh, we track all of the reporting in every single program and update the catalog every month, actually a couple times a month, to make sure that every single manufacturer who has invested in product transparency, or even a little bit in any of those programs, gets representation in the catalog. So by the time uh, 2017 was up, we are reporting that uh, there are 
1,225 EPDs from all North American program operators uh, in 19 of the 35 CSI master format divisions. And you can see that concrete and finishes uh, have the most, uh, with finishes having the most participating manufacturers, largely because finishes is a big category that, that covers a lot of uh, popular sections. Um, and just so that you know, next month we'll be publishing a, a very detailed trend report that not only has this data, but a lot more uh, data behind it. So watch for that. It'll be free. Um, you'll be able to uh, download it and we'll do a webinar about it too. Now, there's been a ton of material ingredient reporting, and I think people understand that uh, there's less effort, less work, less uh, process uh, required on the part of the manufacturer to do uh, one or more of these types of disclosures or certifications. There's two kinds. There's disclosure programs and there's rating systems. And uh, so there are uh, 27 of the 35 CSI master format divisions have products with material ingredient disclosures. And again, not surprisingly, finishes uh, is the top division, followed by furnishings, and largely because uh, BIFMA did a great job getting level off the ground and getting its members to get its products uh, level certified and then getting level to be uh, an accepted program in the green building rating systems. So what does that data actually look like from an information design perspective? So when we launched the catalog in October of 2016, there were only 350 brands that had invested in product transparency, either environmental or material, that was it. 350 brands. In a little over 14 months, there are now 960 some brands uh, with you know, every week or two, another brand uh, producing some, some kind of disclosure. Um, you know, that's triple in literally you know, 14 months, triple the number of brands representing some untold thousands and thousands of products. And the reason I say untold is because most disclosures, whether it's an EPD or a material ingredient disclosure, uh, represent or can be used with or for 1, 5, 10, 20, 50 products, depending upon how that disclosure was created and how the manufacturer uh, creates its products. And so it's very difficult most of the time to look at a disclosure to understand which products it goes with. And manufacturers are actually kind of challenged with being able to show all the products that that particular disclosure goes with. And so uh, there isn't really a good way to count the number of products today that are, are covered with uh, transparency disclosures. So I'm gonna turn it over to Michael all right. Thanks, Terry. Uh, just to recap what we were, uh, what we talked about in the agenda, I'm very quickly going to go over what is master spec, talk about some of the current sustainability language within master spec and the sustainable design schemes that we currently support, as well as one that we're uh, going to incorporate fairly soon. Um, how to use the sustainability language in master spec. There's a couple different ways you can do that. And then I'll do a very brief introduction to product master spec, because that's going to be one of the first places we're going to roll out some of uh, what we're talking about doing with sustainable mines. Um, just a quick update on what master spec is and where, where it's coming from and where we're going. Um, it is the AIA master guide specification. So the American Institute of Architects actually owns all the intellectual property. And Avitru is a software and content developer that uh, maintains, updates, and distributes master spec. It's going to be 50 years old in 2019, so look for some pretty exciting announcements. Uh, we're pretty pretty stoked that uh, it's been a product that's evolved with the industry and been, been around for as long as it is, and we look forward to supporting it uh, for hopefully another 50 years or so. Um, with respect to the content within MasterSpec, uh, I would say on average we do about 5,000 hours of research each year. 
Um, that's really kind of a, a minimum to tell you the truth uh, among our content developers. So we spend a fair amount of time uh, taking a look at the master spec sections, starting really with the uh, engineering or architectural review committees that meet. Um, and then we'll go ahead and take a look uh, with our individual writers, all of whom are architects and engineers, uh, to go ahead and make sure the content reflects what's currently in the market, um, new products that have come out, new uh, means of doing work, et cetera. Uh, we do at minimum four updates a year. Right now, those are roughly quarterly. Uh, hopefully at some point in time, we'll be updating that a little bit more often, but we're not quite there yet. As I mentioned before, we've got about 910 sections as of the first quarter of 2018 with several thousand products within master spec. I briefly mentioned the architectural and engineering review committees. Uh, we are the only master guide specification system that has uh, two committees. Um, there's actually three because the engineering committee is split into electrical and mechanical. We have an architectural, electrical, and mechanical review committees composed of six to eight members each who uh, take a look at a lot of the content within master spec. Um, it's essentially a peer review. Um, and so you're getting information and guidance from your peers as to what needs to be maintained update and updated. Um, and then we use that often as the basis for changing or updating a section. Um, we follow the industry standard CSI three-part format, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes, um, but that's what's used for most construction specifications in the US. Master spec is obviously compatible with the AIA contract documentations. It's also compatible with EJCDC contract documents uh, with some minor changes, mostly with respect to uh, definitions in division one and then changing in the technical sections, a couple of those uh, definitions that go back to division one, just because EJCDC uses them a little bit differently. Um, also, We've recently uh, discovered that if you do remove the, the list of manufacturers within master spec um, and do a couple other things, again, kind of close to what you would do if you're going to use AJCDC documents, uh, master spec is far compatible. Um, so it has been used on several government projects and by some agencies. With respect to the content, uh, we follow CSI master format, which is a number and title system. So if you see a number, any number and title that is associated with a master, specific, master spec specification section that comes from master format. Um, there is not a one-to-one -one correlation between master format and master spec. Master format is approximately a 600 page book, um, which has probably 20 to 30,000 numbers and titles within it for all sorts of products and works results. Um, as I mentioned, we only have about 910 specification sections that cover most of what's used in vertical construction in the US. We follow CSI section format as well. That goes back to that three-part specification. I'll dive into that in a couple minutes. Um, and as I mentioned before, master spec is developed and maintained by professional and licensed architects and engineers. So all of the content that's within master spec is being written by people who on average have about 20 to 25 years of experience um, writing and updating specifications or in the industry. Uh, master spec is unbiased as it comes out of the box for architects and engineers. Um, when you buy master spec, you do not get any content that is specific to a uh, manufacturer. You have to go outside of that, that box um, to go ahead and get it. We coordinate master spec sections both within um, the different parts of a section, but also with other technical sections, um, but then also division 00 and 01. Master spec is generally performance or reference standard based with very few exceptions. Um, some of those exceptions are just because there are no reference standards. Um, one uh, section that comes to mind is when you take a look at the division 262-726 wiring devices, there really aren't a whole lot of standards or agreement among manufacturers for what exactly is a commercial grade, industrial grade, heavy duty grade um, electrical outlet. So we've gone ahead and actually worked with all the, the four or five major manufacturers in that space and got them all to agree on kind of a common definition at that point. Um, and then we listed uh, make and model for each particular manufacturer. That's really an exception. Um, typically, if we can uh, have a reference standard out there, such as an ASTM standard, UL, et cetera, um, of which we quote several thousand within master spec, we will go ahead and base uh, the product performance on that reference standard or performance standard because 
it is much more uh, unbiased and very clear to the contractor when they're interpreting the documents what what criteria have to be met. Master spec is also leading edge, not bleeding edge. So we will not typically put in products uh, into the architect and engineer version of master spec that have just come out. We typically look for some sort of a track record. Um, with a new product, it typically takes about three years for that product to get some sort of uh, or being noticed in the market um, and then starting to being used. So it actually could be several years at that point until you see a product within master spec um, just because there are there we're not going to in incorporate that product until there is some sort of a track record and then it's a decent product um, we try to uh, maintain the integrity and the reputation of master spec by really only specifying products that have been proven in the field that will work for uh, generally most applications if it's a really highly esoteric or specialized application um, you may find a product some products like that in master spec, but generally that won't be the case. We try to cover about 80 to 90% of what architects or engineers would need for a building um, as kind of their basis, base products. With respect to sustainability, we currently support LEED 2009, which is still the most specified sustainable design scheme within master spec. Um, we also started supporting LEED version four um about three or four years ago just after uh, it came out we also support green globes the international green construction code um, ashray 189.1 is still supported within master spec we're trying to figure out exactly what we're going to do with that um, in the near future and then we're actually working with the international well building institute right now um, on a specification in division one for the well building standard version 1.0 and then we anticipate once they release version 1.1 we'll have something to follow shortly after that um, I had mentioned consistency and the how we update specifications and just wanted to, to go into that for a, a moment or two um, as I mentioned we have writers all of whom are licensed architects or professional engineers um, we have the review committee coming after that that we typically do a draft of a section which will go out for either in-house review or kind of a public comment period among some users. Um, once we get that draft back in, we typically incorporate uh, all as many comments as we possibly can. Um, we then do actually a technical review, which again could be in-house or external with one or two subject matter experts. And then on top of all of that, we do an editorial review, uh, which is basically a, a separate group within Ma uh, Arcom. I'm sorry, Avitru, I need to need to remember that it's still hard for us some of us too, um, to go ahead and make sure that all the language within master spec is consistent you know both within the section but then also section to section and division within division and the biggest question we often get asked about the content in master spec is what triggers an update probably the number one thing is user feedback on a section um, any user within master spec has the ability to uh, click on a button or a hyperlink while they're in a section, either if it's in uh, the Word or in one of our online platforms and submit user feedback. We typically try to respond to that within 24 to 48 hours. And more often than not, that will trigger an update to a section if it's a fairly valid comment. Um, we also keep track of a lot of standards codes, references. Um, federal mandates were something we were actually doing a lot with a couple of years ago. That's died down a little bit, but energy efficiency was a big deal and it affected several products within master spec a couple of years ago after some legislation went into effect. Um, we are always looking at best practices. Again, the review committees are really good with that as well as informing us of the latest design change or design changes or trends. Um, technology has actually played a huge part in updating master spec sections, especially anything that has any sort of electronics or a computer in it. Um, and then generally, we also take a look at in the age of a section sometimes. We try to keep current within a couple of years. Um, typically, if you see a date within master spec that's a couple of years old, that's not atypical. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a couple of years old. We may have updated it since. Um, and sometimes you have to check what you've got within master spec, or we just may not have um, done such a um, heavy update that we went ahead and updated everything in it. So getting to the meat of what we're talking about here, sustainability within specifications. I realize there's a little bit of information on the slide. I'm going to take a, a, a couple minutes to really go through it. 
Um, really, sustainability and specifications is like an inverted triangle. You set very general requirements within Division I. Um, in this case, typically, it is uh, Section 018113, Sustainable Design Requirements. There may sometimes be appended with a dot one three dot one six dot one nine, and that just indicates what um, sustainable design scheme you're using, such as LEED 2009 or LEED version four. This section will basically identify what sustainable design scheme, in this case, let's say it's LEED version four, um, and then what are specific criteria to LEED version four. This could be anything from uh, inclusion of extra copies of submittals or an extra type of submittal review um, down to even listing out certain criteria such as VOC limits, um, any sort of uh, material recycling limits, any sort of workflow or workplace issues that would need to be taken care of. And those are very general, very broad requirements typically. Once you get into divisions two through 50, which are the individual technical sections, it gets a lot more specific it's very product specific at that point um, and there could be one product within the specification section or multiple and we'll get into how to um, how to deal with that in a, in a moment or so I had mentioned the three-part section format part one is is general so that applies to all products as indicated within the section again that could be one product or several product um, in part one you're gonna have anything uh, that's very general to that product or products for instance submittal requirements um, product storage basically very general things that do not specifically relate to the product itself. The product itself is described in part two of a section. So it's gonna be on a per product basis. Um, and as I mentioned, you could have a single product or multiple products within that section. So if you have a drywall uh, specification section, it's very typical that you could have several different types of drywall specified and they would be identified or called out with some sort of identifier that links back to your Revit model or your drawings. Um, and it'll identify the unique requirements for each type of drywall. Um, I talked a little bit about submittals. Typically there's uh, a, any sort of submittal that's for sustainable design. Uh, some projects, they are actually separate submittals. Some projects, they're the same submittal that the architect or engineer will go ahead and review. They're just going to take an extra look at it to make sure that it complies with any sustainable design requirements. Um, and then part three is execution. And execution is basically how any special instructions to go ahead and install the product. Um, so I mentioned part one, we talk about the submittal requirements here. Typically within master spec, when you get it out of the box, you're going to see some sort of green hyperlink. These are all arranged by topic, not necessarily by sustainable design rating scheme. And um, we do that deliberately. You can, you have to go ahead and expand it because there are criteria that fit these general topics for many um, different types of sustainability. So, or sustainable design schemes. So if we double click on one of these green links, it's gonna open what we call a sustainability builder. In this case, I've clicked on the link for the EPD or HPD and it's gonna go ahead, bring in language that is specific to EPDs or HPDs, and then insert that into the specification section. Um, at this case, we've identified what credits are in there um, and what sustainable design scheme. This is lead version four. If you took a look at the entire entry, we also have um, language for all the other sustainable design schemes, only if they have a need for EPDs or HPDs within, the, uh, within that section. So these are criteria that would apply to any product within part two that's required to have sustainability um, characteristics. So talking again about gypsum board or wall board, if you take a look at 2.3a, um, we have to indicate there that there is a sustainabil sustainability submittal required for this type of drywall. Um, this is an example. There may or may not be a product that has that. Um, but if you take a look at 2.3b, for the gypsum board, it is not required to have a sustainable design submittal. That may be because it's just a product that doesn't have one or you've hit your quota for that particular um, that part particular project or that particular pro type of product. Hey, Michael, I'm just gonna do a quick time check. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I mentioned product master spec. 
we have this is where we're really going to roll out um, our first step with uh, sustainable mines, and that is basically free specification sections that are based off of master spec for specific manufacturers and products. You can sort by manufacturer divisions. They're available at productmasterspec.com. Um, you also, if you have a master spec subscription and use Paragraph Builder, you can go ahead and get a version of the product master spec. These are gonna have sustainable design requirements and links back to sustainable mines um, for specific product data as we roll out product master spec sections for products that are in the uh, sustainable mines catalog. And for master spec customers, it's not available, unfortunately, if you uh, just go to productmasterspec.com. We have track change versions available for master spec subscribers so that you can go ahead and see what we've changed um, when you download that through Paragraph Builder. Um, when you get it, like I said, off productmasterspec.com, it is not, uh, these, this is not available. You just get a clean version of it. Um, and with that, it's back to you, Terry. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm always amazed by the, the depth and complexity of your products. Um, and frankly, by the whole uh, specification process. Um, so as we said at the beginning, Sustainable Minds and Avitru are at the beginning of this relationship and we're looking at what each of us has right now and looking at how those things can come together, but also looking really to learn from the way people are working now so that we can streamline that workflow and make it easier to do things that wasn't possible to do before. Uh, so Sustainable Minds is a customer-centered product development organization and every product that we've built, we've worked with customers for over a year going through many cycles of uh, requirements, prototyping, testing, and the transparency catalog is no different. We worked with many, many manufacturers and building professionals uh, in many cycles in the last 14 months to build an educational marketing and customer service platform. And we say that because it's not a product database. Yes, it's a resource for products, but you don't show up at the catalog, get presented with a search box, type in a CSI division and go. We will be adding that functionality later this year, but the catalog is all about showcasing the brands and only their products who have invested in product transparency. So in fact, there's a massive filter uh, over the catalog, which is just for that. Um, because people have to learn while they do, those tools are built in education and marketing. So we don't sell sponsored content. We don't sell advertising. We don't want to take away from what the manufacturers are actually doing. And we are a thousand percent committed to delivering the best user experience that it needs to be simple, standardized, and always free to use. There will never be any charge ever for anyone using the catalog. And in fact, uh, on top of that, we are super committed to data privacy and user privacy. Uh, your use, uh, your usage of the catalog is not anything we actually capture or track, and therefore it would never be for sale. We don't believe that our mission uh, to support manufacturers and architects to select better products and build better buildings uh, is supported by a business model of selling uh, analytics to third parties. Manufacturers' data is their own data. Users' data is their own data. Uh, that's not part of the equation. But this is how we really uh, modeled the transparency catalog on the concept of a virtuous cycle. And the virtuous cycle business model has been used over and over again in every single industry, but has been the model 
to create the most disruptive businesses. And you can see that uh, Uber is a virtuous cycle model. Amazon is that too. And the whole point is that uh, the more choice, the more people asking for choice, not only drives innovation and improvement, uh, it manages costs. You're going to get better products at lower costs, higher performing. And uh, you, know, you can see it's used over and over again. There's a thousand diagrams view. You go online. Um, but the virtuous cycle model is particularly effective uh, in a mission-based company. And uh, if you have a mission and you can apply meaningful and useful tools to it, that's how to build uh, a really uh, highly successful platform and particularly when there's an emphasis on, on customer experience. So we've talked about the challenges, we've talked about findability, uh, what you'll find in the catalog is every manufacturer who has invested in product transparency for the North American market. And as I mentioned, every product in the catalog meets one or more of those green building rating systems eligibility requirements for product transparency. The design, is uniquely designed to benefit both manufacturers as well as building professionals in that virtuous cycle that ultimately will result in driving change and reducing impacts. We have several ways that manufacturers can tell their stories, both in a featured brand format, uh, which is an integrated marketing tool with functional performance, environmental performance, how they're improving their products, everything you'd want to know about them. And we have uh, simpler ways to present that information as well. And I'm going to dive in and do a, a quick demo and show you uh, what the catalog looks like and how you might want to start using it. Uh, we're excited actually today. We just uh, launched a new brand, Owens Corning. We'll take a look at it in a minute. Um, but you can browse every single brand in the catalog. And I think this is important that you can actually see how many brands and how many industry organizations who have spearheaded doing industry-wide EPDs, uh, they're, they're all there. And like I said, later this year, we will add some filtering and, and sorting capabilities. But right now, um, you can come and look uh, in at all the brands I'm going to show you, uh, let's start with Owens Corning. They're brand new, and it turns out they are also uh, have product master specs. So now when you come to this listing, uh, you can see all of the products from Owens Corning. You can click on the link, the product name, go directly to their website for more detailed information. But I can now see in a glance what products they've got environmental performance information for, what material ingredient disclosures they have, and you can click right on those links and go directly to the disclosures. Uh, they're all right there. You can see they're all valid. And what's very interesting to see is that in this case, Owens Corning has used a variety of material ingredient uh, disclosures for various uh, products in, in various divisions, and you can see in a glance what they have, and you can learn a little bit more about their commitment uh, to transparency, but also the other certifications and ratings that they've achieved, and you can go to their website and even learn more. Um, let me draw your attention to this virtuous cycle model. Any of the manufacturers that you see here uh, where the link is not green, but it's uh, blue or bold, uh, is a listing that tells you, the AEC, hey, this manufacturer has products with transparency information. We're even going to tell you what kind. They've got EPDs, but you're going to have to go to their website to find their products because we don't believe in uh, scraping the internet or taking content from manufacturers who haven't provided it and so our request to you um, 
is if there's a particular brand whose products you like and you actually know somebody there and you think that manufacturer would benefit by having uh, their information in a catalog expressly for people who want to find and specify these products, then I invite you to use the handy link in the listing. Like I said, you have to know that somebody at the manufacturer's uh, facility, we don't spam people, uh, but you can let them know, hey, take a look at the catalog. I'm emailing you from your free listing. You might want to check it out. It's going to be a, a good thing for you. Um, I mentioned the featured brand. Uh, I want to show you the latest featured brand that we launched uh, is for Knopf Insulation. Uh, here we are in their brand showroom. Uh, where now you can find all of their products with transparency information. Uh, you can click to learn about each one of them. This is a transparency report. It has all the information you would need to make an informed decision as well as get direct access to the specification. We've added a whole new set of functionality. By the way, uh, we've embedded in the transparency report all the lifecycle information as well as all the interior material ingredient information and what the manufacturer is doing to improve. And everything that Knopf is, is doing across the life cycle of its products to get those results uh, in environmental performance and, and material health. This new project builder that we built in uh, allows a user to uh, start a project and select products uh, that you would want to use in a particular project. Uh, because I selected the Jetstream Ultra, it already populates into that selector. Um, you can create your own transparency catalog project library. The only information you need to put in is a username and a password. That's it. It's only to be able to create the library for you to store things. It's not for harvesting information. We don't ask you anything about your job or who you work for, your title, none of that. It's simply technically for you to, to be able to have a library. When you do create an account, uh, you're going to get an account that has an example project already set up in it, where you can see all the products that have been selected for a project. You can always uh, edit that project, add more products. And what's meaningful is that uh, now, Anybody who actually is learning about specifying insulation um, or really wants to, uh, if you're a contractor or a facility manager, for example, uh, really flesh out that specification, you can do that. Uh, and all at the same time, you can then get specification help either through email or by calling, or you can even request uh, a quote. And when this gets sent to the manufacturer, all of the specification information that you put together in the configurator goes with it. You get direct access to the specifications. Now imagine if all of these specifications included the transparency information as well. So we're really working to close that loop. To wrap up, um, the reach for the catalog is all kinds of building professionals. And because of the partnership with CHIPS, we have a lot of uh, school districts and government folks who come as well. We see month over month uh, increase in uh, visitors, both new and returning. They spend a long time uh, on listings that have a lot of content. Um, and so literally to close that loop. The things that we've identified to do together, Avitru and Master Spec, is one, help people get the specs. Uh, if you go to uh, the product Master Spec site and you see uh, the transparency catalog logo, it's gonna take you right to that listing and vice versa. We're gonna be working to uh, improve and enhance the kind of content that will go into a product master spec to stipulate how products with transparency information 
get specified that will link directly to the catalog. And uh, you know, the big exciting thing is to get those products with transparency information accessible for selection through MasterSpec. And we are going to continue to de deliver education sessions to AECs and to manufacturers because everybody needs education uh, to be able to do build better buildings, make better products, sell those better products in that virtuous cycle. So here's some examples. We already have a whole handful of manufacturers who have product master specs and listings in the catalog. And our goal to, is to address these top challenges in a meaningful way to really drive change. Education for everyone, bringing together standardized solutions from brands you trust, integrating those standardized solutions, and providing ways for the virtuous cycle to actually do its job. So that brings us to uh, the top of our hour, and I uh, want to thank you for spending the time with us. It was a lot of content. Uh, like I said, watch for more, and uh, any question that didn't get answered, on this webinar, we will follow up with you to get that answered. And there's a quick three question survey on your way out. If you have a chance to leave a response, that'd be awesome too. And everyone will get an email letting you know that the recording is up if you wanna let people uh, listen to it or re-listen to it yourself. So Michael, thank you for uh, your time and uh, Thanks for the work we're doing together. Oh, thanks, Terry. And I guess we invite everybody to have a great day, right? Absolutely. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye.